So I would say that I had a Catholic cr up upbringing, but that I was rather apathetic, even though I went to all these Catholic places for school about my faith. And then, like many of you here perhaps, I went to college and met campus ministry. And by the way, green and gold are the colors of William and Mary. So, <laughs> also Francis the University of Stephen. But I went to one of them. So, and they have an awesome campus ministry program there. And I got very involved. Um, first, by the help of a girl that I was interested in, I love telling that story. It all started with her. But then along the way, I met these guys called the Youth Apostles. And I couldn't figure out what they were. And I went to a party at their house. And you know, you know college parties, right? So I showed up, and they had the snow cone machine going. And um, this one guy was making french fries and deep fat fryer. And uh, um, there were sprites to drink. But that was how they the party. But everybody wanted to go. We watched movies like What About Bob and Groundhog Day. So this was back in the 90s, by the way. Um, actually, one time we did have the cops come when I was living there. Oh! Right? And um, we had a new neighbor next door. We were making too much noise. So I, the cop comes into the apartment. Ooh. And I think he's expecting to find, you know, red solo cups filled with who knows what everywhere. And there we all are with our Sprite cans. <laughs> he didn't know what to do with us. But one of the awesome things, and I've said this a million times, so some of you might have heard this before. One of the, the things that really inspired me about college was when I met these guys, the youth apostles, um, which Father Peter was already one of, and then John Moore was destined to become a part of already at that point, um, was that they were, I thought, really cool guys that loved to have fun and did crazy zany things, like go out and play wiffle ball at midnight just because we're in college and we can. But then that next morning, we would be dragging ourselves out of bed to go to 9 a.m. mass. And that somehow stuck with me, how, how much fun it was to hang out with these guys. Well, you come back to their apartment afterwards, and they'd have pancakes and bacon. So, and it was better than, you know, we'd get at the calf. So that, that was all I needed. But it really just inspired me how into their faith these guys were, and yet how normal they were. And to me, up to that point, I didn't think the two could, could go together. So I started hanging out with them more and more, eventually became a youth apostle. Along the way, I helped out one summer with a high school program at St. Mark called CLC. Woo! So, yes, Yoda went there. And that was when I met John Moore, back in those days. Um, and then I kept hanging out with youth apostles. And then after college, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. So I, I went back to youth apostles. Um, but they helped me find a job doing youth ministry, and then eventually I started to think that God might have bigger things in mind for me. And that was a scary thing for me, because I really thought I should be married. I liked, again, I liked girls, right? Um, but God kept sort of putting his little thoughts in the back of my head that maybe there was more to my life. And he, he kept bringing me people like Father Peter and Father Jeff Peterson, whom you've met, and a lot of other priests and a lot of other great people who loved the church and were awesome, awesome people. And this is the thing, I didn't have some kind of intellectual conversion where I'm like, it all makes sense, I understand it now. <laughs> now I will become a Christian. No. Oh. It doesn't work like that for 99.99% for of the people. God works on our hearts. And he draws us in. And I think that's one of the awesome things about community and things like that. Is that we come together, we, we build friendships and relationships, and we encourage each other and help each other to start to love the Lord, to open our hearts, to think about things in different ways. And that even to bring the pain and the challenges that we face in the past and ongoing with us to this community. And here, God works on our hearts. And he strengthens us. Now, someday, he's going to send us all out. Like he does with the 12 apostles in the gospel today. He's going to send us all out. And we may not be able to find a community just like this. But he's going to send us out to do his work and to go and build communities like this. And to go and start our own. 
And that, I think, is what CCM needs to be about. And I think that's what Father Peter's vision is, that we come here to grow for these four, five, six years, however long we're here, and then we go out. And I said this at the Christmas party, I think almost everybody here is in a Bible study, or should be. If you're not in one, get in one. Um, and then what are you going to do? You can go anywhere in the world and know how to start a Bible study. And you can, you can email us and say, hey, what was that book we used for Bible study? I need to get ten of them. We'll do that. You know, you guys can come back and go and become leaders. And that's what the Lord, I think, was putting on my heart. Was I wanted to do more, and I wanted to be someone who was there with people in those moments in their lives, their birth, their death, their wedding, when I could be a representative of the Lord. Not, I'm not the Lord. I'm not God. But that I could be that kind of person for them. So what are we doing here? We're here um, to have an encounter. And we're here to get to heaven. If you don't want to get to heaven, I don't know what you're doing here other than the disease is great. But hopefully, all of us have it in our minds that we want to get to heaven. And that's why we come and we keep coming. That's why, um, you know, John and Kristen and Jen and Father Peter and all these people are here. Not because we make a million dollars working it, but because we're convinced of that God has called us to his plan of salvation, and that the best thing, and the thing that's actually going to make us happy is to pass that on to someone else and to share that journey of Jesus with somebody else. So, at the heart of it, that's really what Lent is about too, which is what I'm supposed to talk about a little bit tonight, is what is Lent and how do we get into it? Because it's, I'm, buckle your seatbelts, Lent is in like five days. Six days, five Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, so look out. It's coming. And it's gonna it's gonna be rough. Like, you know, I mean we're gonna you're supposed to wear sackcloth and ashes and, um, not wash your hair or you comb it. Don't do your laundry. Um, I think in Lent you're supposed to just go around moaning about how horrible life is and never you know, don't tell any jokes or funny stories or um, just like be miserable, right? Is that, you know, and, and well, I'm playing, I guess I'm going to give up chocolate. <laughs> or, or maybe it's ice cream for you or just all sweets, right? Okay, let's come in again. Time to give up chocolate. No more hallelujah. No more happy thoughts. <laughs> And no meat, no meat. Right, this is what we think we do. Oh, Lent, oh, gosh, Lent. Lord, why do you have to have Lent, right? I mean, why can't we just have Christmas all the time? <laughs> that, that, you know, we got lots of sweets, right? We're in the desert, and it's dry, and we're alone, and it's hard. Only part of that is what Lent is about. Yes, we're called to give things up. Yes, we're called to forgo certain things and to simplify our lives, simplify many things in our lives. And yes, it's supposed to feel like a desert because we're supposed to get rid of everything that might distract us from the Lord. We're supposed to walk with Jesus those 40 days that he was in the desert and prepare ourselves for something great and awesome and incredible, something that changed the world 2,000 years ago but something that still changes our lives and hearts if we let it today. That's a different way to approach Lent. And Lent, funny, believe it or not, is called springtime in the church. And what do we start with? We start with ashes. So let me tell you a quick fairy tale about ashes. So there were a boy and girl. I learned this in German class many years ago, and I forget most of the details. <laughs> but they're a boy and girl, and they're going into the woods on a journey, and they pack a lunch, and they're going, and they want to make sure that they can get their way, find their way back, right? Sounds a little bit like Hansel and Growl or something like that. You know, he, he scoops up a big bucket of ashes from the fireplace, and along they go, and every, every, every so often he drops a little clump of ashes along the path to mark the way they're going. So, I don't remember if there's a witch in the story, there might have been. So let's pretend there was a witch, and they had their little battle with the witch, right? And then they turn around and go back. Only problem is, it was Snowzilla, 
and they can't find their way because the ashes are now covered in snow. Well, this is one of those wonderful magical fairy tales. And so they can't find their way, and so they wait, and they wait. Maybe they have to go back to the witch's house and wait for a while. So the storm ends. She's dead, right? I think they killed her in the office. The storm ends, and they go out, and they find these flowers growing along the path that they can't see where he had dropped the ashes. Because this is a, this is a fairy tale about Lent and, and Easter. And the point is that in, in every fairy tale, and a lot of them deal with ashes, right? Like Cinderella, anybody ever think what Cinderella means? The girl in the ashes, cinders, the girl in the ashes. Every time their ashes appear in one of these German folk tales, it's because they represent something that's about to become transformed. It's about to find new life. Ashes are a great fertilizer, so you put it down, and new seed grows out of the ashes, and new life comes up where once was death. And that's, that's what Lent is supposed to be about, is that out of death, out of the death of our souls, of our sins, of our hurts, our pains, our sufferings, our trials, God wants to bring new life. He wants to bring transformation. So whenever, even that, that moment next week, when you come, on Ash, well, not Ash Thursday, Ash Wednesday, um, to get ashes. I, when I was at the parish, people would come by on like, the day after. Can we still get ashes? Mm, well, it's not really Ash Thursday. Can we, but we're signed with ashes, and, we, and remember that you are dust, and in dust you shall return. Or, um, what's the other one, Father Peter? Turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel, right? It's supposed to be, yeah, it's a mark, and it's kind of a strange mark that we put in our heads, and it's ashes, and it's ugly. It's supposed to represent a desire I have, a, a turning, I, I'm not wearing this sign so that I can show off to everybody else that I'm Catholic and I'm cool. Oh, those are good things. <laughs> um, but because I want to be reminded and to remind myself that I need to turn away from those parts of my life that are hurting me and turn back to the Lord. Turn back. That, that's what conversion means, is a turning back. To be converted is to turn back to whom? To God. To allow our hearts to be transformed and transfigured. So what do we do? Well, my, my task, I don't know, I don't remember what the title was today. I haven't been on Facebook as much, Father Peter, since uh, since then. So you can't give up Facebook for Lent because Facebook is how you find out about events at CC, and a lot of people do that. But you can't do that. <laughs> so, so, but I wanted to come up with a few, a few ways, things to do during Lent. And who's made Lenten resolutions before? Some of us, a lot of us, okay. So I'm going to steal a story from Father Ramon that those of you who are on the Yah Retreat have, have heard before. So, um, who has not seen Star Wars? Anybody? A few of you? Most of the girls. Peter. Well, so back in the original one, which you've seen, back in, remember the original one? Yeah. And... You know, there's this empire, and there's the rebellion, yada, yada, yada. And there's this Death Star, right? And they built the Death Star. It's, it's the, uh, the greatest force in the galaxy. There's nothing that can stop it now. They even say that at one point, right? And then, and then along comes Luke Skywalker. He's got the force. And um, what happens at the end of the movie, spoiler, the Death Star blows up, what? right? <laughs> So the great, it's the greatest force in the universe, and this one guy with like a with like a revolver that you know from the hip, he shoots it down, right? That's Luke Skywalker, right? So then, you know, then comes Empire Strikes Back, which is probably, in my opinion, the best of the Star Wars movies. And in that movie, the uh, the Empire is kicking butt, and they don't have a Death Star in that one; they just have Star Destroyers, which they seem to be able to turn out by the dozen, and uh, just a couple of them showing up makes the rebellion flee. So those are, you kind of wonder why they don't just kind of lean on that a little bit more, because they're winning with those. But then the next movie, they build another Star Destroyer, or another Death Star, right? And um, so oh, it's, gonna, it's bigger than the other one. It's more powerful, and it, you know, it's fully functional. It's got this shield and all these cool things. Um, and, and they're losing the battle against this big Death Star. But of course, what happens? Somebody figures a way to fly a ship into it, and blow it up again, <laughs> right? So the, the most recent movie that came out, which people haven't seen, 
spoiler alert. There's another Death Star in that one. <laughs> this is great. Final Ramon on Earth. This was a homily. It was, it, was, it was phenomenal to me. There's another Death Star. It's bigger. It's more powerful. Look out. You can't, you, you can't shoot it down. You know? And so what are they going to do? Oh my goodness. They fly a ship into it and blow it up. Some of you guys are having your head, you know, mind blown. Right? Right. So Father Ramon, this, he gives us this retreat, or this homily on retreat about this, and he's talking about resolutions when he says this. And he's like, "Oh, my resolution didn't didn't work last year. Let's let's make it bigger. <laughs> It'll be foolproof then." And so every year we make a bigger resolution and we resolve, "I'm going to give up chocolate. Uh, you know, I'm going to give up Facebook. I'm going to." You know, pray more. Uh, if, I'm going to pray all day, every day in the chapel, and I'm not going to leave except to go to class. Right? We have these huge, huge resolutions. And that's not necessarily what God needs us to do to make huge resolutions. What He wants us to do is to draw closer to Him. So I'm not saying don't have resolutions, but I'm saying let's think about what we're, we're going to resolve to do. And maybe like those. Instead of like building Death Stars, maybe we have some smaller, more reasonable things. That's what that was my point with the little um, the Empire wins and they just rely on their little star destroyers, which are still pretty huge. Um, so there's some oldies with goodies in here. For instance, that whole fasting and abstinence thing. I know your favorite, right? So um, why fasting and abstinence? Well, we're trying to train our will. You know, so if we're in the desert with Jesus which is the goal, then how do I train my will? How do I, how do I be in that desert? How do I get away from some of those, those things that distract me? All the time, when it is, you know, seven o'clock at night and I haven't eaten all day, that's a bit of a distraction. I know, right? So we gotta be smart about this, right? Um, abstinence lowers the quality of food you're eating. For instance, we don't have meat, maybe you're avoiding sweets, I highly recommend that. But abstinence, which is we do during Fridays of Lent. Um, so, Ash Wednesday and Fridays of Lent, we abstain from meat. And I, I recommend abstaining from desserts too. Right? But we, you can still eat. So, you're not starving. You're just taking away some of those more fun things. And maybe you're, you're doing something good and healthy, like salad, that you don't enjoy quite as much. But you're still taking care of the body. And, but also getting away from some of those distractions. And then there's fasting, fasting harder. So you guys are old enough to abstain, and we abstain from the whole of our lives. Fasting, you just got to make it to 60. Once you're 60, you don't have to fast anymore. <laughs> you still have to abstain. But so fasting is just two days out of Lent that we're required to fast. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. So, and that makes a lot of sense, like Ash Wednesday, the start of Lent. You know, you can fast for one day. Come on, guys. Um, and Good Friday, that's the day that Jesus died. You know, we need to make that a special day. Um, and, I, and I strongly recommend being here for some part of that day on, on Good Friday. That is the day that we remember that Jesus died at 3 p.m. for us. I thought that needs to be a special day. It used to be that everybody closed down shop on Good Friday, just went to church. But we, need, we need to have some of that. But fasting is smaller portions of food. So you do two small meals and one normal meal. And the two small meals shouldn't be more than the normal meal. So, wait a minute. So you're, fa you're saying I have to fast, but I still eat three times a day? Yeah. So what's the hard part? I don't know. <laughs> oh, you don't get the snack, you know. And for those of you who are of age, or, and I know some of you are not, but um, I recommend uh, cutting down on that alcohol as well, especially on those days. Um, not because we have to lose weight, but because the practice will give you strength in the spiritual life. It strengthens our will by weakening our attractions to sensual things. I hunger for food. I'm, I'm a little addicted to food, right? I'm always thinking about where's my next meal. I need to get away from that a little bit. I don't need nearly as much food as I eat. My, my belt and my pants are telling me that. 
it helps the heart to grow longer, larger. And abstinence makes the heart grow fonder. So what can we abstain from? Well, not just food, but maybe we're not making big purchases. You know, no, no new clothes, not fancy food in restaurants. Maybe uh, we're cutting down on those entertainments, you know, um, you know, like going out to the movies. Maybe we do that less as a sign. I'm not telling you you have to cut out every fun thing out there. But maybe, hey, instead of going to the movies, let's, let's have a game then. Because that can be pretty awesome. And that can be ways in which we're building community with others. Um, pick one thing, maybe, that you'll fast from other than food during Lent. And give, them, give the money you would usually spend to a local charity or to the rice bowl. Um, and maybe this is where we make a list of excesses in our lives. Which ones could we do? What things can we do without? It, it's just 40 days. I mean, it's, not, it's like six weeks. Um, it's only half the semester, so. Yeah. Okay, so that's one, fasting options. Pray, two. Um, prayer is how we encounter the Lord. And this is the goal of it all. Let's encounter God, because that's what's going to be in heaven. It's not going to be a country club where we just sit around, bored all day in heaven. We are going to be actively engaged in the greatest adventure of, of existence in heaven. It's to be, to be encountering the infinite God. And there's, there's nothing greater that we can do. There's nothing that will occupy our minds and our senses. And when we get them back, our bodies more than the, the adventure of encountering God in heaven. It will, it will be... Phenomenal and spectacular. Words will not even begin to describe it. Our minds will just be flooded. And we will be filled with awe. And, and we're called to do some of that now. And that's what prayer is about. Prayer is a, is a daily invitation to God. And there's times where in a prayer we do adoration, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is huge. As well as that petition of asking God for things. Um, and, and, and seeking His will. And there's 40, like, there's actually 46 days during Lent, but um, Sunday, they don't count Sundays. So, but pray daily. Let's, let's encounter God every day, guys. If we can do nothing else, this Lent, if none of these other things happen, let's pray more during Lent. Let's make it the best Lent ever. That's, that's the theme that Father Peter wants to go for, best Lent ever. And uh, there's, there's actually a, a thing about that. Um, maybe part of your prayer is to come here a little more often. Maybe you make that. Maybe you make a visit to the chapel a little more often than you do. If you're not accustomed to that, maybe maybe you make that once a week for 15 minutes. Or maybe go to an extra mass every week. So maybe I just go on Sundays. Go another time uh, here or at the hub. Um, I know um, Father Peter's got lots of opportunities for for confession. We're in our parent service. Um, maybe if it's been a while, maybe now's the time to go. Let's let's start Lent uh, with clearing this, cleaning the slate. Don't wait till the end. People always wait till the end, and well, that's good. But how much better if we start with a clean slate at the beginning of Lent? Um, so that's prayer, and I, I have a separate one here for for spiritual engagement, spiritual uh, intellectual. Engagement. So encountering God, spiritual reading, Bible study, reading the Bible. Um, also, regularly, daily. Maybe you just start with reading the Gospel for the day. There's some great websites. I get an email every day from the Daily Gospel, and every day they send me the readings for the day. It's not an email. You can read it while you're brushing your teeth. And just have that one nugget of the Gospels from the Lord. Um, but encountering the Word of God. God speaks to us. All right, put that differently from prayer. So prayer is one thing. And, and encountering the Word of God can be part of your prayer time. But do some spiritual reading. Do something to, to increase your, your spiritual appetite. Um, and alongside that, I had another one, which was make a commitment to try something new spiritually. So maybe you're not, you haven't been to many, many times to adoration. Maybe that's something that you want to try. And I know uh, we do that, we seem to do that a couple times a week here, is have adoration and praise and worship. 
So Valeria seems to know when all those happen. She's out there somewhere. Um, maybe you want to join the group that prays the rosary here. Or maybe Stations of the Cross. Now let's walk with, if we're in the desert with Jesus, let's walk with Jesus the way of the cross. Let's encounter it. So. And the final thing is to do some works of mercy. Some way that we are encountering God. To do some service to another. So a lot of the things I've been describing so far, I think that I do on my own or we do on our own with, with groups. Let's let's do something too that, that goes takes us out. Let's go to the juvenile detention center. Or let's go with uh, the group to the Pascal Lamb. Or not the Pascal Lamb, the, uh, the Lamb. <laughs> go to the Pascal Lamb too. They've got some great books. They're right up the <laughs> if you tell them you're a, uh, a poor college student and Father Peter... Once you get a book, maybe they'll give you a discount. Um, it's an awesome little bookstore. I, I, I love it. They've got some cool stuff. Um, so it's a year of mercy. Maybe that's something that we can do is one of these things. Um, spiritual works of mercy. Converting the sinner. Instructing the ignorant. Counseling the doubtful. Comforting the sorrowful. Bearing wrongs patiently. Wow. That's a tough one. Bearing wrong. Like someone's wronging me and I'm bearing it patiently. Forgiving injuries. Praying for the living and the dead. And then there's corporal works of mercy. Feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, harboring the stranger, visiting the sick, ministering to prisoners, and burying the dead. Whatever happens, guys, I think the most important thing is that we don't stop trying in this Lent. If we, if we fall down, let's, let's redouble our efforts tomorrow. And let's, let's always... Try to say, uh, I've made mistakes, I've messed up, but the next opportunity that goes, comes to me, I'm going to do the best, may try to make the best decision in that opportunity. Um, to do the next best thing. Just that the next thing that comes my way, I'm going to try to make the right decision with that. And then I'll worry about the next decision. Or to have the best Lent ever is the goal. Not just... Oh, I'm gonna have one like last year, and you know, last year I gave up chocolate, so I guess I'll give up chocolate. Again. I mean, giving up chocolate is good, and that's that's great. Um, but let's let's make it about drawing close to God. Let's make it about increasing our spiritual life, um, drawing in holiness. We can never get enough in that. So, and Father Peter was telling me that there's gonna be a website that we're gonna be putting out there where you you sign up and you get an email every day? Yep. Every day, three minutes, and it's the best learned ever. It's how to make each day intentional. So, so in my, I had, I had, a, I had a, an extra point for a kicker, um, for things to do for Lent. So how many people are here, 140, thereabouts? Father P would love it if all 140 people went on retreat. So I had an encounter of the silent retreat. Um, I would I would say that that would be one of the, the best things to do to make it the best Lent ever. So it's an awesome couple. Of, they're both awesome retreats. Uh, they're they're going to be great. And um, what better way to give some time to the Lord than, than give Him a whole weekend? So. Do you recommend breaking your fast on Sundays? Why or why not? Oh man! I, this is one of those questions that you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Because um, there's there's people that are on different sides of this one. So, um, here's some wise advice that I got from from the uh, the vicar general of the diocese a few years ago, the current vicar general, Father Peter, and um, he said, you know. It's Sunday, and, and yes, technically the church does not include that in the 40 days of Lent. So, it's a, Sunday is always the Lord's, Lord's Day. It's always the day of resurrection. So yes, you can relax the discipline. But the way he said it was, relax the discipline, don't throw it out. So if you want to pick one of the things that you're doing, or maybe a little bit here and there, to... to Please do not gorge yourself on chocolate and ice cream. <laughs> and say, it's, it's Sunday. <laughs> it's like it's like one of my roommates in college. He uh, he stuffed some potato chips in his mouth, like filled it all the way up, and then he looked at us and says, "I'm having trouble fasting." <laughs> so uh, 
you can relax the discipline. But I would say it's 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 still a Sunday in Lent, so it's a little different than you know like Christmas Day or Easter Sunday when we're just going all out a little bit more. So um, how does that sound, Kyle? I like it. So I mean, some people, I I do know people that I admire that say no, I I want to be firm in this, and I'm gonna continue to 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 practice my disciplines during Lent. I said that's great because here's the thing, guys. You choose what you're going to offer to the Lord. I, it's 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 interesting to me when people. Um, I mean, now the church said we have to no, no meat during during uh, Fridays and fast on these days. But you, other than that, you guys choose what, and it's an offering to the Lord. What you're going to give up, what you're going to do. So you decide. But whatever you decide. Be intentional about it. Don't like wake up on Sunday and say, you know what, I'm deciding that I am not going to fast at all. You know, make a decision and stick with it in advance. And if, if if it helps, have somebody you're going to tell your decision to and talk it out with. And have somebody who you're going to be accountable to. Um, because it is, I think it is beautiful for us to make a sacrifice when we offer it to the Lord. Suffering on its own doesn't really help us much. Suffering that we unite to the cross and offer to the Lord and say, Lord take this pain and uh, this trial that I'm going through and use use the, the grace from it for someone else. That's that's powerful suffering. That's salvific suffering. Um, but so you you decide what you're gonna do and how you're gonna do it. So anything else? Yeah. Um, how would you explain Ash Wednesday to someone who's How what? How would you explain Ash Wednesday to someone who's How do you explain Ash Wednesday? Um I would say it's the start of Lent. It's the start of uh, our spending 40 days in the desert with Jesus. And so we try to make it a, a solemn day of, of prayer and, and fasting like we're in the desert with Jesus. And one of the, uh, an ancient penitential practice was to mark yourself in ashes. Um, if you go back and look in the Old Testament, like Job and some of the, some of the other folks, whenever they were under great suffering... They put ashes on their head, and it was uh, it was you know it's it's sort of a, a de-beautifying of yourself, I think. So um, it's just, um, but it's it's also a, a mark for us, a reminder. So I love we've got some of the buttons back there with the ash Wednesday thing on them. I think those are great because I'm going to see that every day. Um, does that help? Yeah. So I I like the idea of. We're spending 40 days walking with Jesus through the desert. And really, this is a reminder for myself um, more than anyone. I'm not trying to show off that I'm Catholic. So. But and I, and I come to the church. Pablo. Um, are there any like saints that had a particular, like, maybe fasted or sacrificed it, or somebody that like offered intercession during Lent? Oh, like Lenten, Lenten saints. Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of any saints that had a particular... Uh, had particular, uh, I mean, certainly St. Francis was known for his poverty and simplicity. So if you're looking for someone to help you with fasting and abstinence and giving things up, he would definitely be a great one. Also, Claire, with alongside with him, um, she was she was sometimes overly extreme in her parents. And we're not called to be overly extreme. We're not called to, to do harm to our bodies. But um, I would start with those two. There's, there's a lot of great things, and all of them live like in some way. So... Jordan. Why is Ash Wednesday not considered a holy day of obligation? That's above my pay grade. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to that one, to be honest. I usually try to like keep mum on that. When people say, oh yeah, Ash Wednesday, I gotta go to church with Yes, you should go. <laughs> That's good. And, and, you know, Father, I have to confess that I didn't want to go to, go, I didn't go to church on National Day. Well, okay, the Lord is good. <laughs> um, I, I don't know why that is. Maybe because it didn't need to be, because people just did it. I think it's interesting, too, that Good Friday is not a holy day of obligation. I think, um, did you know that? Yeah, isn't that wild? Um, I'm sure we can find some long discourses about how this developed and why, but I think because it was by 
by popular claim that people just did these things, the church didn't need to say, hey, wake up, you need to go to church on this day because we're celebrating so-and-so. It's like, no, we do this. It's, it's great. Really, uh, the practice of Lent grew out of people doing this as part of their preparation for baptism. So it was a baptismal thing. And then other people said, I want to do that. I want to re-enter into that moment to pre- as if I'm preparing for baptism again. And that's really how it got going back in the, the very, very early centuries of the church. Um, but I, I don't know much else about that. We could probably look it up on Google. Google probably knows. <laughs> Was there a question over here? Peter's Bueller? Oh. Why did Jesus go to the, de- to the desert in the first place? Ah, good question. Why did Jesus, so if you remember back in the scriptures, Jesus gets baptized by John in the Jordan. And that's kind of the first time in, in all four of the Gospels that we, we, we meet Jesus. Very early on, he's getting baptized by John in the Jordan. So, I mean, in Luke, we meet Jesus at the Nativity, but then we meet him as an adult at, at baptism. And the idea is that this marks the beginning of his ministry. John has prepared the way he has foretold him. He has prophesied about him. Jesus has come and says, John, you have to baptize me. And then the Spirit comes upon him. And we start to mark, okay, now the Lord is is beginning his his work of salvation. Um, So the first thing Jesus does, and, and Jesus did this every day, a number of times in the scriptures, the day starts and it says, Jesus went off to a quiet place to pray. Or they, they went searching for Jesus. Um, so here, the Spirit comes upon him. And, you know, the, there's no answer. You know, at what point did Jesus know everything about what was going to happen to him? But that he, he's moved by the Spirit to go off for 40 days. And 40 is a, a, a kind of a magic number in the scriptures. So, you know, 40 days of, of, uh, of rain on the ark. Uh, 40 years in the desert. Elijah walks 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of God. Um, 40 kind of, and it's all about preparation. God is preparing his people to enter into Israel in 40 years. God is preparing Elijah to do his great work in 40 days. So the 40 is really about preparation. And that Jesus is preparing for this work and spending time, as we should, with the Lord. And in the desert... People will go off to the and lots of saints in the in the later century. If you're looking for more saints, uh, Simon the Stylite and some of these other guys. It's Anthony in the desert, Pablo would be great. Um, they go off in the desert because there there are no distractions. So yeah, life is tough. And if you're Jesus, yeah, you can you don't need to eat, I guess. Um, but there are no distractions. It's just me and the Lord. So, all right.